It's The Real News Network. I'm Greg Wilpert, joining you from our studios in Baltimore. The world's population recently reached 7.6 billion humans this month. Even though this number sounds incredibly large, a recent study of the relative weight of different forms of life on Earth found that humans make up only 0.01% of all living matter, or biomass. The vast majority of all uh, life is plant life, actually, which makes up 82% of all biomass. The study also found that cultivated animals, such as poultry, cattle, and pigs, make up 60% of all mammals. Finally, despite humans being a very small representation in terms of biomass, they can be held responsible for the extinction of 83% of all mammal species and 50% of all plant species. The study, which is titled The Biomass Distribution on Earth, was published in May by the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It was authored by Jinon Baron, Rob Phillips, and Ron Milo. Joining me now from Tel Aviv, Israel, to discuss this study is Ron Milo. Ron is a professor at the Weizmann Institute of Science, where he studies the cellular highways and energy of, uh, of energy and carbon transformations in quantitative terms, both within the living cells and in the global environment. Thanks for joining us today, Ron. My pleasure. So, what to you is the most surprising finding of the study? So, in this census of life that we did, we found several things that surprised me. One was, whenever you ask a biologist that I just did it, say, last week when I was giving a seminar at Princeton, what is the most abundant thing on Earth? Is it plants or bacteria or animals? The majority of people would say it's bacteria. And we found, after doing the quantitative survey, that it's actually plants, as you mentioned before. Similarly, when I would think about, for example, birds, and you would, and you would ask the question, what do we have most in the world? Is it uh, wild birds, like in the big flocks that we see on uh, nature films? Or is it the domesticated birds? My tendency would be to think that it's the uh, wild birds that we see in flocks. But what we found, which surprised me, was that there's threefold more biomass of domesticated birds, mostly in the form of chickens, uh, which outweigh all wild birds combined together. So this was just two of the things that surprised me. So the study focused only on the relative weights of different types of living matter or biomass on Earth. However, given what we know about human activity on Earth, what does your study allow us to conclude about how humans have shaped the life on Earth? Yeah, so we were looking at the absolute values in terms of mass of basically every living form on Earth and made our estimates on that. And we could also compare that to what uh, are the best estimates to what uh, was on Earth before humans came into the scene. And what we could find is that the overall biomass has already been half. So we only have one half of what used to be in terms of total biomass. That's mostly because of clearing of forests in order to make place for agriculture and for grazing areas. And the other thing is when we're looking at, for example, wild mammals, we found that the amount of wild mammals that we have left is only about one fifth of what it used to be. So somewhere around 80% of the mass of wild mammals is already lost and we have only the remaining. So presumably you did not go around weighing or even counting every form of life. In your definition, like you mentioned, you also include bacteria and even viruses. So how, in general terms, did you figure out the relative biomass of all life? So what we did is uh, what's known as a meta-meta analysis, meaning that indeed we did not go into every corner of the earth and did all the measurements. We based our survey on many, many different studies, hundreds of different studies, each one collecting values from many locations around the Earth, be it in the oceans or be it on land. And we integrated all of that information together. And the fantastic student, Dinon Baron, in his PhD work, found ways in order to extrapolate from the many measured points, also find mathematical relationships about the points that were not yet measured. And when you integrate over all that, you get the best values that we could report in, the, report in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So what are some of the, what you would say are the more notable conclusions from your study? I mean, what, what, uh, what does this allow you to conclude and what makes it significant? So it gives us uh, a holistic picture of what exists on Earth. 
And there we could see, for example, that if you compare the mass of uh, wild mammals, the death of uh, humans and livestock, we see there's about 30-fold more mass of uh, domesticated mammals than all wild mammals combined. So, for example, I have three small daughters at home and I often, you know, read them a book about animals or do a puzzle together. In the puzzle, usually you have like an elephant next to a giraffe, next to a deer. It's now makes it clear to me that the if we had to do it realistically, it would be a cow next to a cow next to another cow and maybe a pig somewhere and, and, the, and the person. Uh, so I think it gives us a new perspective on, you know, what we have on planet Earth right now and therefore maybe what we want to make sure to take care of. So that's maybe one perspective. Another perspective that came out of it regards the issue of how uh, pyramids, biomass pyramids are built. There is this notion of uh, the ratio between how much consumers and how much producers there are. And through our study, we found that in the oceans, the pyramid of different uh, life forms is very different from what we thought before. Can you say a little bit more about that? I mean, what is uh, exactly different uh, with the oceans than what, you, what we normally assumed? So, so it's a bit counterintuitive, but if you look on land, right, you would find that there's more consumers than producers. You have many more animals and in, it, there's much more uh, mass of plants than the animals that feed on them. But in the marine environment, in the oceans, what we could show is that you have what's known as an inverted pyramid. The picture is reversed. You have more biomass of fish and, and uh, similar organisms in respect to what's known as phytoplankton, the, uh, the organisms that produce them, that, that produce the energy from taking the sun. And this is a result of the fact that they're very productive and they live for a very brief period of time. They usually live for just a few days, whereas the fish that feed upon them live for several years. And therefore you have this inverted pyramid of the standing stock of, of these uh, life forms. So that gives a new perspective on the structure of life in our oceans. So just to conclude, I mean, what are some of the things that you would say in terms of um, the effect or the impact that humans have had on the planet? We already mentioned the extinctions, uh, but um, in terms of also the large number of uh, uh, domesticated mammals, uh, what, what would you conclude from that, I mean, uh, based on what you've studied? Yes, so we would conclude that even though in terms of mass we're a pretty small fraction, about 0.01%, that is 1 in 10,000 uh, part, in terms of our impact on the biosphere, it's already pretty overwhelming in terms of decreasing the overall biomass by a factor of two, decreasing the mammalian biomass of all wild things by about a factor of six. So we already have very, very significant impact. It's also what's denoted as like a new geological era, the, known as the Anthropocene, meaning that we're like in a geological period where we are a force of nature. Uh, and I think this gives us some uh, food for thought about, you know, how much we consume, how we consume it, you know, how we produce our food, all of those things that have a big impact uh, through us on land, on water, and on all living things. Yes, I guess it gives a new idea as to what it really means to be living in the Anthropocene. Uh, but we're going to have to leave it there for now. I'm speaking to Ron Milo, co-author of the study, The Biomass Distribution on Earth. Thanks again, Ron, for having joined us today. Thank you. All the best. And thank you for joining the Real News Network.